Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first seminar of the day, the Scottish Virtual Nature School. Before we start, can I remind you all that this morning's session is being recorded and we'd be very grateful if you could keep your microphones and cameras switched off during the seminar. We'd love it, though, if you would interact during this morning's session, are making really good use of the chat pane. Please do add comments, questions, use emojis. We'd love to hear from you during the session. For those of you who are using social media and might be tweeting about today's session, please use the hashtag SLF online so that we'll all be able to find each other's comments. And if you have any technical difficulties this morning, please don't panic. Best thing to do always is just to log out of the session and to log back in again. And we found that that seems to cure most problems that crop up. So I'm going to hand over to the first of our morning speakers, and that's Claire Smith, Kate Smith. Thanks, Shan. Um, I just wanted to um, to introduce myself um, and introduce the the session. So my name's um, Kate Smith. I'm policy lead for outdoors within the Early Learning and Childcare Directorate at the Scottish Government. And I wanted to welcome you all to our session this morning. Um, thanks to everybody for getting up early. It's a it's a breakfast session, so um, hopefully you all have a cup of tea with you. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our session about the Virtual Nature School. Um, it's a project which we funded during COVID to consider whether we could increase children's connection um, with nature and their time spent outdoors um, by using a virtual platform. So the project's developed over time and children and families and practitioners have been inspired by taking part. We have a vision for outdoors in early learning childcare in Scotland, um, and that is that children will spend at least as much time outdoors in their time in early learning childcare as they do indoors. And Virtual Nature School has definitely supported us towards that vision. I'd also like to welcome some of the practitioners and settings who took part in the Virtual Nature School um, and it's really important that you know that they're here today um, particularly when we get to the Q&A session at the, at the end of the session um, because it's really great to hear directly from people who, um, who took part and, and thinking about the impact that that's had on their practice and their experiences. Um, our Minister for Children and Young People, Claire Hockey, would have loved to have joined our session today. Um, she wasn't able to, but she has recorded an introduction to the session. Um, and I think that Shan is just going to play that for us now. So welcome again to the session and I hope you enjoy it. Enjoy it. Hello. As Minister for Children and Young People, I'm delighted to be able to introduce this session focused on the Virtual Nature School as part of this year's Scottish Learning Festival. It would have been lovely for us all to be taking part in this session in person. However, as has become the norm, we are doing what we can in an increasingly virtual world. That's why it's so important for us to recognise the work of the Virtual Nature School in reconnecting children, practitioners and settings during the COVID-19 pandemic, all through a focus on outdoor play and learning. Play learning and having fun outdoors helps to improve well-being and resilience, increase health through physical activity and allows children to use the natural world to help develop curiosity and science skills. Research shows that children are generally spending less time playing outdoors and are growing up in an increasingly indoor sedentary world. This can have a significant impact on their physical health, emotional well-being, social competence and their connection with the natural world and their local communities. COVID-19 has reminded us of the importance of engaging with the natural world. Getting outside now is not only essential for our mental health, but it also provides a low risk environment for socialising and play. Over the past year, the outdoors has offered children the chance to play with their friends unhindered by many of the restrictions. It's also played an important part in the COVID-19 health guidance and many settings have looked to increase or maximise their time outdoors. As a result, engagement and appetite for outdoor learning is perhaps higher than it has ever been. 
as more practitioners and teachers consider how to spend more quality time outdoors and look to develop their own confidence, skills and understanding, knowing the benefits that this can deliver for children. We want to work with practitioners to develop strong communities of practice, enabling high quality outdoor experiences to become the norm within early learning and childcare and through into primary schools. Through funded projects such as the Virtual Nature School, we want to support opportunities for practitioners to increase their understanding of outdoor pedagogy. I would like to commend the work of the Virtual Nature School and highlight the impact that this has had on children and families, childcare practitioners and all across Scotland. It's great today to be able to hear from Claire and the team and from practitioners and settings about the difference taking part in the programme has made to their practice. I hope you enjoy this session. Great, thank you so much. Um, good to hear from uh, the minister there and um, some good words from her. Um, I am Bravo. I am one of the team from uh, Virtual Nature School. I'm here with Dr. Kay Warden, um, who was leading the, um, the Virtual Nature School. Um, so we will hear a few words from um, Claire now, and I will um, just share a short video. Whilst the video is playing, um, may I encourage you to ask any questions or put any comments um, in the chat box, and then we'll um, be able to talk about them um, after the session. It will be also good to hear where you are uh, joining us from today. So please do uh, type in in the chat as well. Great, I hope you can uh, see my screen now and, uh, and the video. So I'm just going to play it and then um, if you can't hear it or anything, just uh, shout out and uh, we'll be able to try and correct it for you. OK, here we go. Welcome to this presentation where we're going to be sharing with you some of our thoughts around the Scottish Virtual Nature School, which ran uh, during the pandemic in 2021. I'm here with Bravo, my colleague, and together we created the concepts around Virtual Nature School, which were then adopted by the Scottish Government and rolled out to all the children in Scotland. One of the things I think about Virtual Nature School is that it does leave you with that almost sense of questioning as to whether or not nature can be made virtual. What we found through the whole project and as we ran it was that actually the secret to this success was about the building of relationships, the communities of practice and how very little time was actually spent on screen. It was a provocation for going outside and engaging in the natural world on your doorstep. So it was applicable to both families and to community members and also to the hubs and practitioners who were working there. So it was very much part of the national strategy. And as we all know, um, outdoor learning is very much embedded in the vision for the work that we do in Scotland. Um, it meant that we could really build on a foundation of awareness and it meant that we could then offer this provision to all settings with funded hours in all areas of Scotland. And the feedback from all areas of Scotland was that through the process of the year, every single local authority engaged. So by the time we were on cohort three, we'd actually been able to work with people in every region of Scotland, which was wonderful. The focus for us in this provision was to really increase the time and quality of outdoor play during the pandemic. That meant we needed to look at what that looked like in terms of being at home, but also looking at hubs in schools and looking at those settings that remained open through the duration of lockdown. It was an interesting process because the whole thing had to be very flexible. It meant that we had to be very responsive to the changing dynamic because many features of that pandemic were unpredictable. As you know, um, it was the need for us to be very responsive, the need for us to be creative, that meant that we came up really with a whole range of different ways of working with settings and with individual families, um, because we could really focus then on pedagogy. It wasn't about just giving a series of activities, it was about the conversation of how you work 
outside with young children. So in the image we can see here on the screen, this is a classic example of the provocation around loose parts, which you can see here from the very first picture of just the collection of a random set of sticks. And the richer and more diverse that random set of sticks, the greater the potential for play. So many children took it into thousands of different directions. And so this builds on an inquiry-based, a play-based pedagogy, which meant that it was really important that the floor books and the talking tubs were integrated into this approach so that we were documenting children's ideas and theories and giving them this sense of provocation so that when they came back to us and said, actually, I'm going to make my stick into a raft, we had some of those skills and some of those ideas that we could then respond to those children's ideas in a way that meant that they could achieve their goals. The way that it ran in the first cohort was that we really wanted to minimize the amount of time children had online to be less than about 40 minutes a day. We only ran on the weekdays and we timed it so that children had time to get up at home and get themselves ready. And then at 10 o'clock, we would meet online in a live video conversation and a whole variety of different platforms in the end. And that meant that we were beaming straight into settings, but we're also beaming into homes. We were connecting to families in that way. Then the families would go outside and that meant that they could respond to the provocations that we put together in a short film. They had downloadable materials that they could use um, to give them that additional support. And then they would upload images and videos into a very uh, closed, protected group, a bit like a Facebook group, if you will, so that we could then engage with them in that frame. That's entirely up to the family then to make the decision about whether or not they're going to use that platform. We used a variety of different methods when we were working with schools and settings. Then what happened was that obviously there's a real need and dynamic there to want to be able to support practitioners. And so we could then link practitioners. They were linking directly to families, but we could link directly then to practitioners through conversations. And that meant that two days a week, we would have pedagogical conversations together as a group to make learning communities. And that happened through a learning management portal. So that it meant that we were doing multiple uh, touches, if you like, multiple reaches out to community, to family and to practitioners. But they came together in a very holistic way, which became one of the key aspects of the virtual nature school. So let's just enjoy a short film by one of the practitioners who was part of the virtual nature school called Beverly Zingoni. Hi, my name is Beverly. As a child minder, child-led participation is important to me. I always want the children I care for to know I respect them and their views matter. So when I joined Virtual Nature School back in June 2020, I was excited to see it was a programme that embraced children's voices as participants. Throughout Virtual Nature School, the children have always had lots of fun and provocations like this one have enabled the children to freely create for themselves, regardless of their age. Even the 14-month-old loved experimenting with nature and Play-Doh. In a forest. I'm making a forest and I'm making, I remember the wee bit was down out there where our den is and I'm trying to build a wee bit. So I might put a bit of bark there so it looks like a wee wooden bit. So like people can climb up with there. So like it's a certain area, like a tree that you can climb. So I'm gonna make a small wee bit of bark what can probably fit in there, like this bit here. I'm going to set that in right there. I like being in virtual nature school because I like to be outside with nature and animals and exploring within nature and making things. 
As you will have been able to see in that film, one of the key aspects of the virtual nature school is to hold on to the principles of the realising the ambition, being me, and also the curriculum for excellence, because it became very um, obvious that actually it wasn't just children from birth to three or birth to five. We had families we were working with, so that meant that the content had to be able to be differentiated through the child's engagement in it. And that meant that our context had to be very broad. So the final cohort was actually all about just the process and skill of looking, looking up, looking down, looking through. Whereas other cohorts, there'd been a broader inquiry focus for about a week, such as bones and big teeth um, or boats and things that float. Those ideas had come from the children at Auckland Nature Kindergarten, which is where the first cohort of the virtual nature school was beamed out from. I think it's important that we understand that process. So let's listen now to the impact of those provocations and how they worked in a situation where a childminder in this case was working with a wide age group of children. Vertical spiders and spears was a wonderful provocation for activating the children's natural curiosity and fascination. It offered great flexibility and equal participation for all the age groups within the setting. The children loved exploring the natural world for circles and every child was inspired to wrap, twist and weave. Each day the children were filled with great ideas. The children loved exploring and learning about how different a stick could be bent and manipulated. The stick selection process was really connecting the children with their natural environment. And when they were creating their own nature-inspired circles, the children found it relaxing, despite the levels of concentration and work involved. When it came to whittling, Alexander was in his element. He spent ages looking at the different types of sticks to whittle and carve for the perfect bow for his bow and arrow. The children were amazing at managing the risk and keeping themselves and others safe. A year later, the children are still being inspired to weave. It was lovely to watch my own two on holiday this year use their imagination and skills they had learnt from virtual nature school to create boats to carry stones over to Ireland. They had brilliant discussions about the natural materials they were using and if they could withstand the water, rapids and the weight of the stone. Once launched, they loved watching to see if their boats would make it across to Ireland. That day, the children found their own nature-based learning opportunity and brought it to life. When you look at the impact on all those different children and how they were all able to engage in the inquiry and provocation, it would lead you perhaps to make the assumption that um, that would be enough. But we very quickly realised that for some parents or some families and for some practitioners, they really wanted um, more support. And so we pulled together a nature play diary Again, light touches of provocations of possibilities, but not set activities because they go against the playful pedagogies that are very important within our curriculum in Scotland. So this was a download and many nurseries and practitioners sent it out through their communication systems. Um, other parents came directly to us to download it independently of their setting or school. As with all of these things, there's a real sense of wanting to be consultative. And so we were really building on the idea of empowerment for children, but also for their families and therefore for practitioners as a community. Um, one of the things that came out of that very first cohort was the idea that it was a very short, brief moment that they had to commit to. A lot of people were very time poor, a lot of settings and schools we're already um, engaging in home link work, um, but it might not have been based in outdoor learning. And so for us, we listened to that feedback and created a program of take a moments, which went out every day, linked to the main provocation, the main fascination during that week. And it meant that if all people were doing was able to look at their phone, whether they were looking at a digital platform like Facebook or they were looking actually at the centre's own um, digital platform, there were this constant stream of little reminders going out. 
it was very important, as I said, that we listened to the voices of practitioners. And we had a very diverse group, everybody working in play, working in home-based environments as childminders, working in early years environments, working in the early stages of primary school. We also had families at home who had children who were ranging from birth right the way through to 11 or 18 years old. So when we started to look at that and, and open that door to consultation and agency, people started coming forward with their own ideas. And so one of those was to really increase the amount of accessibility to this work. And so there was the creation of Makaton films. Now, one of the things about the skill base that you have in a, something like a community of practice is that it allows you then to really build on the skills of your group. And so Beverly had created um, and had learned herself some Makaton. So we worked with that association to create a whole series of vocabulary films based on the seasons, based on the things that we felt children might be exploring. Look up. Part of that work is not telling practitioners, but coaching. And it's about the acknowledgement that we all have our own embedded knowledge to give to this situation. Many of us have been working with early years um, and in education for 30 or 40 years. And so there's an embedded knowledge there. So to support that, we had practitioner provocations, which were made accessible to everybody in the virtual nature school. Those people from across Scotland have really given us an insight into the place-based experiences of all of us, whether we're working in Shetland or we're working in Perth and Kinross or indeed in the city of Glasgow. There are commonalities about what we do, which we really were then able to celebrate. And so it was really good to be able to get video testimonials from many of the practitioners to really give us an insight about the impact VNS has been an amazingly positive experience, and all the children and families benefited from it. I discovered a community of practice, which really supported me in staying outdoors over winter months. VNS gave me the tools, practical advice, and confidence to stay outdoors as much as possible in all weather. Most of all, as a new chairmander, VNS supported me to connect and learn with and from other early year practitioners. The Virtual Nature School has made a huge difference to the way I work. It's given me a greater understanding of how to develop a nature pedagogy within my setting and how truly beneficial learning through nature is to the young children I care for. As a childminder working through the pandemic, it's been difficult to meet colleagues in real life for professional support. So being able to be part of a community of practice that DNS has made space for where we share our expertise in weekly conversation has been invaluable. Hi, I'm Elizabeth and I'm an early years practitioner in Bar Hill, South Ayrshire. I can honestly say that my virtual nature school experience has been the most informative and inspirational training I have ever been involved in. I've enhanced my practice and extended my knowledge in so many ways. And the knowledge and expertise of Dr. Claire Warden has been such an inspiration to us all. I've also been fortunate enough to feel part of a community of like-minded practitioners and have benefited from the professional dialogue which takes place between us each week. And that has been one of the biggest highlights of this whole experience. Hello, I'm Claire, an early years educator from Dundee. Virtual Nature School has had such a positive impact on myself and my professional practice and benefited the children and families from my nursery setting. The provocations daily invited us all to explore and investigate the natural world. Children shared their own thoughts and ideas and each new day built on their previous learning. Meeting Daily created a virtual nature school community, one which I'm still a part of, and weekly discussions with like-minded early years professionals from across Scotland have empowered us all to share our good practice and to be able to reflect on our own practice as well. As a childminder, I am a great believer in encouraging children to use their voices and express opinions. The daily activities have helped me and the children to connect with nature, which has been greatly beneficial to their health and well-being. Some of my highlights have been myself and the children working as a team to complete the inquiries, and the use of the flu book and the talking tub has definitely given the children a sense of ownership over the learning. 
The support I've received from Villeneuve's community has been phenomenal. Thank you. So I have been involved in three cohorts um, of Virtual Nature School as well as the podcast sessions with Claire each week. We've had such a good opportunity to deepen the understanding around the use of floor books and also the introduction of talking tubs and, and how to use these effectively with the children. My understanding of nature-based play and learning and how to use the resources that are within the environment as opposed to putting other resources out into the environment. Also ways to involve families in our planning and our learning and again for, for them being able to use what's available to them in their local environment and there's no expense and there's no outgoings. It's just getting out into the spaces and enjoying them. The joy of the Virtual Nature School is that you're working with diverse groups of, of people. You're working with people in all kinds of different settings. And so when we start to talk about accessibility in the natural world, it's really important that we try and talk to the families who are maybe harder to reach, that we work with areas of multiple deprivation. And so let's think a little bit now and listen to the reflections of a family who were connected to OnThank Family Centre. So I've got two children. I have Josh, who's eight, and we have Emma, who's three. So I felt that Virtual Nature School really catered for both their age groups. And it was just so nice how, you know, they both had interest and, and they kind of just did it, to, you know, to their own way of what they wanted to do. I was really just, excited to wake up and do like all the stuff on the Zoom call. It was really fun because we got to go outside. We got to go outside. So we, like yourself, we've got like a week in a wooded area just kind of close to our house. So we just made the most of that every day. And as Josh was saying, they were enthusiastic every day we got up and we wanted to see what the inquiry was. So it was really exciting just to, you know, go out and collect what materials we needed. And then we kind of came back, Josh, didn't we? And we were busy constructing, planning, designing and it was just, it was lovely. It was a really precious time as a family to, you know, work together and, you know, share their ideas and it, it was really, it was a precious time that I really remember lockdown being really nice, you know, with my family and um, obviously as a practitioner, I've gained so much knowledge, skills, ideas that I can take back and put into practice. What's great about Virtual Nature School is we've got lots of ideas and it's just so interesting. It can go in different routes. You know, children will maybe take things different from it so we can build on that. So, And there's all the stuff that we've made, we can also and bring it into the school and show all the other people what we've did. Me and my mum and my sister were thinking about what could bees would like to like so they can sleep in and get cosy. But like all these stuff. We learned that there were so many different kinds of bees and Josh wrote a wee fact on top of his box. What was it you wrote, Josh? Um, on top of your lid that you learned about bees? Bees have six legs. Bees collect um, nectar from flowers. flowers and turn it into honey. I also joined as um, a parent at home during lockdown. Um, I found the experience um, really, really beneficial because um, Lewis struggled a wee bit at home with his schoolwork, um, a wee bit, he struggled a wee bit with routine, um, and we found that um, schoolwork at home wasn't really working for us, um, so we did our um, schoolwork into outdoor learning. Um, so every morning we watched the inquiry and we took advantage of all the nice areas around about our house and we took the dog and we took we went out and explored for hours and hours no matter what the weather um, and that's like kind of similar to Paula we we probably didn't take advantage of that as best we could um, but since we participated in the Virtual Nature School, we have been loads of different new places um, in and around Ayrshire. When we were outdoors, we would take things from outdoor learning and bring it back into the home. So we used it to do um, craft. Um, Lewis has printed off some pictures of his favourite times and he's also today taking them back to school. So I made a dinosaur at Trin. 
um, rocks. We found a big mass of rock that looked a bit like a brain. <laughs> um, and long bendy sticks that looked like bones and rocks. And, and what did we make with them? We made a, um, a skeleton dinosaur and we made a dream catcher. So this was our feather inquiry and we went out to a wooded area close to our house and we found lots of things and Lewis incorporated them all together and made a lovely dream catcher that we displayed in our hall. So he's going to take pictures back to school today and he's going to tell all his, um, his classmates and his uh, teacher about all the things that he made. As with any project, there is a real emphasis on making um, it visible what the impact of that has been. There's lots of data that came from this that proved its effectiveness. Here are just three. And the first one was that people came to us with some understanding of child-led learning, but that moved from 61% to 97% saying that they had a much deeper knowledge of child-led learning through playful inquiries. There were some people who were coming in with 52% only of people coming in with a partial knowledge of what it would look like if they went outside to learn. 5% um, of those were saying they really didn't have a lot of knowledge around nature pedagogy, um, but they've all moved now to 98% of the cohorts of the total number of people that we worked with. 98% felt that they had led to an increase in embedded knowledge. 18% of those felt that they were really in a place of expertise. When you have little confidence in going outside, it means that it becomes a barrier to going outside. So 31% of the people who were involved in the virtual nature school felt that they didn't have very much confidence to go outside. That rose to 100% of the people in the cohort saying that they have high or at least a good level of confidence now in working outside. So what the virtual nature school did was really move people from a place of perhaps greater hesitation, a place of uncertainty to a place of certainty and confidence. And that means that we're now seeing post virtual nature school, the three cohorts have now finished but we're seeing the ongoing impact of this work in many, many different ways. Let's stop now and think a little bit about some questions you might have, um, some comments. We've got some wonderful practitioners ready to talk to us about their own feelings about the Virtual Nature School, because as the organizers, the facilitators of the Virtual Nature School, it's very important that you hear their voice. If you'd like to talk to myself or Bravo about any aspect of the Living Classrooms work and indeed specifically the Virtual Nature School, which is one of our projects, do contact us at inquiries at livingclassrooms.org.uk. Wonderful. Thank you so much to Claire and the team for pre um, that presentation. Um, we really do not have much time left um, because we, we, you know, we are supposed to be finished by uh, quarter two. Um, so we will try and answer as many questions as we can. Um, we've had a few questions whilst the uh, presentation was going on, but I know a lot of you were very focused and listening, so you might not have had a chance to type your question. So this will be a good time if you do have a question or even just a comment about what you've just been watching, please do put it in the comments and we can uh, have a discussion about that. Um, I will invite Claire to um, um, bring herself onto the screen so we can have a bit of a chat. Um, and uh, we'll also call upon one or two of the practitioners who actually took part to uh, maybe help to answer some of the questions. Um, so Claire, um, uh, in response, there were lots of positive comments to what was going on. And um, one of the questions that was asked, which I thought maybe we could discuss in the little time we have left, um, Ella was um, wondering if, if any of the families, practitioners and children uh, ended up taking the provocations in unexpected um, di directions. Um, so I think that would be a good uh, a point to kind of discuss. And maybe I'll call upon maybe Debbie Henderson to think of an example of how that, that <laughs> happened, whilst Claire is uh, maybe talking just a, a little bit broadly about the concept. 
Surely. Um, I'd also um, ask Fiona, um, who's the head of OnThank, um, to uh, contribute a little bit to this, because I think that the, the thing about a provocation is that it drops that pebble in the pool and then it goes off in all sorts of different directions. That's why it's so very different from a closed activity. So pretty much all of them did. And when we were working with the children at O'Clone, um, it was quite interesting that you you go into a playful environment with some intent but it never, ever goes the way that you think it is. So you embrace that process of change and unpredictability, and that's the joy of it all. Um, so absolutely, I'm sure um, some of my lovely colleagues, and I know Elizabeth is here as well, and Martine, if they'd like to unmute and share some of their thinking, that would be great. Yep, so let's have Debbie, then we can ask Fiona as well to, to just uh, share a little bit about that experience. Um, for the others, you could just maybe just type in the chat as well, just a little bit about what you think about that um, um, uh, that question that's been asked. So Debbie, over to you. Hi there. Um, I think for me, um, it's been very much just following what's going on with the children. So we always go into an activity with some idea of what might happen. Um, and that might be broad ranging. Um, an example from our practice, we took our three year olds to the beach to look down. We were looking down at the stones, we were looking at the rock pools. And as practitioners, we thought, oh yes, it'll all be about splashing in the water and it'll be about looking at the stones and seeing what shape. Actually, it ended up being a whole storytelling and map making experience. So one of our three year olds was fascinated because of the marks in the stones that he'd found. He was convinced that a lion had been to the beach and it was very frustrated, which is why it had scored the stones, um, which led to why was he frustrated? He couldn't get off the beach. So we had to figure out where the lion had been and how he eventually got off the beach, because obviously we couldn't see it anymore. We spent that whole morning going across the beach, looking for stones with marks in them, and then mapping out the way that the lion had gone and then came up with a whole story about it. So although we went looking down and looking at splashing yes. on water or beasties, we ended up with a whole storytelling experience. It was fantastic. Great, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Debbie. Great example there um, of storytelling resulting from looking down. Um, Fiona, have you got a little contribution to make um, about this question we've had? Yeah. There you go. Be honest, there she is. She's just going to unmute herself. Hi there. I think one of the things for us was that we had such a wide ranging age group. You know, we had children within our two year old room. We had the three to five room and we also had families at home. So that although we had the provocations at 10 o'clock in the morning, families, children all went in hugely different directions. And I think that was the really interesting part was actually being able to sit back, let the children go with the provocations and child led, which <laughs> is what it's all about. And yes, things did go off in great tangents, but the learning was amazing. And I found, especially with some of the older children, which we hadn't anticipated joining in as part of this, this it was a great surprise to us to see the learning from the sort of 10 year olds, 11 year olds, alongside their siblings of three and two, and how that came together at mm -hmm. their level of learning. I think it's always fascinating, isn't it? And I think so mm -hmm. often in education, what we tend to do is to divide age groups. Yes. But, mm -hmm. but when you look at the outdoor environment, it's such a great yeah environment that's so diverse mm -hmm. that it actually it's a brilliant place for that inter-age working yeah um yeah and i think was, one of the things claire was that a lot of the older children had been tied to screens to do work mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this gave them the freedom to go outside to explore and to lead their learning and that was really wonderful to see the enthusiasm that comes through from that and the learning was amazing and they weren't stuck to a screen. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's one of those challenges when when people say it's the virtual nature school mm -hmm. is that the knee jerk reaction is or oh, you're putting a child in front of a screen to learn mm -hmm. about nature. So that's just secondhand learning. But it's how you get across that really it was ju just that, as I said, that tiny provocation, that mm -hmm. spark that that as you say then ran and yeah. um for mm -hmm. some people they needed a little bit more support but yeah. working mm -hmm. in a space of you know of quite challenging deprivation 
Yeah. Um, did you feel that the take up was quite positive, Fiona? Did you feel that it was um, reaching out to families? The take up was amazing because the platform we used was Zoom. And at that time, families in our area were using Zoom. That's how they were in contact with their friends. They'd Zoom in their phones. And being in area deprivation, if we'd went in and said, well, we want you to use this school-based learning, it wouldn't have happened the way it did. Zoom was nothing new to them. Even the kids knew how to work it within the same. <laughs> they knew how to get Zoom on and how to have the interaction with ourselves, with their their friends. So it was amazing how they could actually, they were stuck at home, but they could see all their friends, they could see their key person. And that was amazing. And that was just through Zoom. Yeah. But, I think it's um it's a phenomenal thing you know, when you embrace the world of digital technology yeah. as a mm -hmm. as a not a consumer like just watching films and watching mm -hmm. playing games but actually as a tool to improve yes. and increase mm -hmm. accessibility to outdoors mm -hmm. I think it's yeah incredible and I think powerful. also being in an area of deprivation a lot of the families hadn't actually gone out to the parks that were in Comarnock mm -hmm. and having these provocations they actually went out and explored things on their doorstep that perhaps they would never have done. Mm -hmm. It's that collective, isn't it, that they see somebody else doing it? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So all my friends do that, so I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Great. Thanks, Fiona. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Fiona. We don't have much time left, but really grateful for all the, all the insights. And those who are also sharing um, in the comments, really appreciate that. Um, Claire, we've got practitioners who are part of Virtual Nature School who are also just um, sharing their own experiences as well, which is wonderful. So Claire, looking forward, looking ahead, many of the practitioners listening to us right now are working with children, um, most likely maybe in the higher um, uh, uh, ages of primary. So. Mm -hmm. What, what would be your takeaway? What would you, you advise them as they go forward? And one of the questions or comments rather was someone was saying they're struggling uh, or they find that the N, uh, HNC students in college, they really struggle with this concept of child-led learning. So mm. is there a little nugget you can leave us in the next three minutes um, that, that will help? A little nugget, just bring that good, forward, good. Claire. Um, a little nugget would be that you have to start from the root. You have to start from the especially in terms of students i think um it's starting from where people are so if you're if you're training and you've never been outside as a teacher as a, as an adult you've never been outside maybe you never went outside as a child positioning that learning that course taking those hnc students out or degree students outside and actually helping them experience that's got to be part of it but but for all of us it's about I think not looking at, at little models of things that we do outside, you know, what I would call the trends, but looking at, OK, how do I work outside my classroom? How do I embed outdoor learning in what I'm trying to do inside? So it becomes so integrated into the philosophy and ethos of your work that you can't imagine a world without it, um, which is absolutely where I probably am now. I can't imagine that you know, A, I've got to give children ideas and B, that I would live in a work, live and work in a place that had no outdoor access. So I think those two things, um, Judith actually put up, pause, you know, give up some of that power that we often feel as teachers um, and allow children then to have the space to be creative and to have the agency and activism that uh, I think is threaded throughout them. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, I understand that we have a hard um, close time, which is um, a quarter two. So we have about a minute left. Um, <laughs> so I can see that we still have lots of comments coming in, um, but people letting us know that they enjoy the experience. Um, so Claire, I think we, we should leave it there. Um, would you like to see, have any final words as uh, practitioners go off to the rest of the festival? Just I think, thank you. Thank you to the government. Um, I know Kate, um, you know, and, and the team for supporting the project. I think a massive thank you to them. Uh, thank you for everyone that's come on this call. We um, we went and stepped out of our little comfort zone, some of us. So I really appreciate the fact that you reached out to, to join us here at the SLF. Um, and for anyone who's new, do keep in touch. Um, it'd be lovely because it's still ongoing. Uh, we still meet. Um, we can't really give up um, that passion that we've got. So do join us if you'd like to. That would be great. Thank you, Bravo, for keeping us right on the IT. <laughs>
<laughs> <laughs> no worries, my pleasure. I can see Kara is also asking if there's going to be any more training available. Um, I don't know if you have any new insight in that on that, Claire. Uh, no, I don't have any insight at all in terms of the future of Virtual Nature School. Um, I do know that we're all very passionate and that if there's any chance we would um, yeah, we would embrace it, but there's lots of ways you can join us Thursday night, come to the podcast. So yeah, just join us any way you can. Kate. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, I think we're we're about to get cut off, but um, yeah, thanks so much to Claire and Bravo and to everyone for for joining us today. Um, if you if you do have any um, questions um, about Virtual Nature School, about what's next, um, or about any of the um, outdoor play and learning resources that we have available, then um, do get in touch. Um, I'll drop our um, our email address into the chat um, so so do get in touch yeah we're really keen to maximize on the learning from the virtual nature school um, and are looking at options for that um, currently so we'll keep you posted super thanks very much everybody um great and uh we'll see each other again soon hopefully outside that would be yes. good <laughs>